Hi again, everyone. My name is Tiffany Jansen, and I'm a graduate student in the Cool Worlds Lab here at Columbia University. Today, I'll be talking about my and David's recent research on constraining the reflectivity of some of Kepler's smallest worlds using their phase curves. If you're thinking, what the heck is a phase curve? then I suggest you check out a video I did a while back, which I'll link to in the description below, which will hopefully answer that exact question. But briefly, a phase curve is the amount of light we see coming from an exoplanet that changes throughout its orbit due to our viewing geometry and the motion around its star. This is similar to how the amount of light reflected off the moon appears to change throughout the month. In other words, when we see it going through its phases, right, phase curve. If this is confusing, definitely check out my last video. All right, so why do we even care about a planet's reflectivity? Well, knowing how reflective a planet is can tell us something about its atmospheric or surface composition. In other words, what the atmosphere or surface might be made out of. For example, like I mentioned in my last video, if a planet is highly reflective, it's much more likely that it's covered in ice or highly reflective clouds than it is to be covered in rock. We can determine the reflectivity or albedo of a planet by measuring the amplitude of its phase curve. This amplitude that we measure will be proportional to the size of the planet and its albedo. This means that really small planets will have really small phase curve amplitudes, so small that they get lost in the noise of the data. But if you take the phase curves of many other similarly sized planets and stack them on top of each other, then their combined signal can become much stronger than the noise. The more phase curves you stack, the better this signal to noise ratio becomes. From stacking the phase curves of different planets, we obtain their average phase curve, from which we can obtain their average albedo. Even though we lose information about the individual planets, stacking phase curves allows us to gain information about their albedos, which would otherwise be very difficult, if not impossible, to measure individually. For our study, we used archived data from the Kepler satellite to stack the phase curves of 50 some odd Earth-sized planets and about 115 planets that are more similar in size to Neptune. Similar studies have been done in the past, but as you can see from this figure, our study really gets down into the lowest radius regime yet. And with a herd of 115 planets, this is the largest phase curve ensemble study to date. So why only these planets? Why not stack all of the Kepler phase curves that there are. Well, for one, we don't want to include planets that have really clear phase curve signals on their own because then that would dominate the phase curve ensemble. Our goal is to measure the albedos for some of the smallest planets, which have really small signals. Also, in order for the stacking method to work, we need a lot of data from the individual planets. This means we need to look at planets with very short orbital periods. Specifically, for our study, we're looking at planets with years less than 10 Earth days. This ensures that we get to observe many, many orbits, which means we get lots more phase curve data. Before we could stack the phase curves, we had to make sure the data was free from any interfering signal from the host star. We do this by detrending the data, literally removing any trends from the host star, like from star spots, for example. Detrending stuff can get pretty technical, but basically we wrote a new program called Phasma that separates the planetary phase curve signal from any stellar signal. You can't be so stupid as to think this will be easy. Now this method only works because we know the period of the planet from the transit data. If you're interested in the more technical details, then feel free to look at our paper, which I'll link to in the description. After detrending and stacking the phase curves, we then fit a series of phase curve models to the data in order to determine which parameters, like albedo, produce a model that matches the data the best. From these fits, we were able to constrain the maximum albedo of the two ensembles to 95% confidence. For the Earth-like ensemble, we determined that the average bond albedo is capped at about 0.6. In other words, it's very, very likely that most of the planets in the Earth-like ensemble reflect less than 60% of the light from their host star. Basically, what we can conclude from this is that most of these planets aren't covered in ice. So they're not like Enceladus and they're not like Europa. This is probably to be expected from planets that are so close to their stars. We can also conclude that they're probably not covered in highly reflective clouds. So they're not really going to resemble Venus. If anything, they probably resemble something more like Mercury. From their fits, we find that the upper limit on the Neptunian bond albedo 
is at about 0.35. In other words, less than 35% of the light is reflected from their surfaces. This is pretty dark. Our own Neptune reflects about 30% of the sunlight that reaches it. This means that the majority of planets in our Neptunian ensemble are darker than our own Neptune. One theory as to why they're so dark has to do with the composition of their atmospheres and the immense temperatures they experience at such short distances from their stars. A full explanation of that might require a whole nother video, but it's interesting to note that planets that are so similar in size can have completely different atmospheres depending on the environment that they live in. From all of us in the Cool Worlds Lab, thanks for watching. For more updates on our research that we do here and other cool space facts, be sure to subscribe. Then we can measure the ab uh, but ah. <laughs> ah, sorry, I got distracted by the blinking. The Neptunian um. <laughs>